Glad to be back. Glad you're back. God bless you. Would you take your Bibles, please, and turn to two selections. If you would go to 1 Samuel chapter 20 first, and uh, then find, if you would, Genesis chapter 31. Uh, it's a thrill for my wife and I to be here and see a lot of you folks. I wish I could see more of you. Um, we just had, we came down a day early so we could be here and fellowship with some of you. You know, it's a wonderful thing to have churches around the country that your members can go to after they leave you and grow in. You might not understand that you have to be a preacher. Many times when people leave the church, they can't find one that they can grow in because it's not like the one they're from. That good or bad, but we have folks in this church that have grown in, grown in the Lord since they came here. And we thank you for it. Thank you for taking care of our folks. And I just pray that God would bless us tonight. I wish you'd pray that uh, he would. <clears throat> we were having lunch today with um, the Pauly family and my wife. I hate for my wife to ask me this. What are you preaching on tonight? Because, you know, she hadn't prayed about it. And... Uh, she, she said, uh, Fred, that's my koinia name. What are you preaching on tonight? And I said, I'm going to preach on what to do when it's over with. And she said, well, I think you preached that here before. Well, I haven't, but even if I had, they sing songs here before and sing them again. Amen. <laughs> Jesus gave... Uh, the, the Holy Spirit gave four accounts of Jesus' life, and three of them are pretty much alike, called synoptic gospels. Deuteronomy is a retelling of the first four books of the Pentateuch. Who said we always have to be original? Every woman here has got a favorite dish you cook when you want to impress people. Now, I want to give you a little secret. Preachers preach sermons over, and we always pick our best ones. I used to tell our church, don't pay attention to that good sermon. Everybody's got one. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I don't think I preached that here. And if I have, you, me, you must need it again because I prayed about it. Thank you. <clears throat> um, would you go, let me read first at uh, 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 Genesis chapter 31. Verse 2. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Now, underline those words in your heart and hopefully in your Bible. And behold, it, it was not toward him as before. Look at verse 5. And said unto thee, them, I see your father's countenance that is not toward me as before. Um, what we have here is a, a relationship that's deteriorating. They had fellowship, and he's detecting that that relationship is uh, deteriorating. And then go to 1 Samuel, if you would, chapter 20. We have the same basic scenario with two different men, but the same problem. In verse 1, David fled from Neroth in Ramah and came and said unto Jonathan, what have I done and what is my iniquity and what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? Uh, David and Saul had a good relationship, but it's going downhill. I want to talk to you about relationships. Let's pray. Lord, I pray tonight that you'd be exalted. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. I pray, Lord, when we go out of here, we'd think more of you than when we came in. I pray we'd know how to be, how to better handle life, and be a better testimony. The Bible's such a wonderful, practical book, deep in theology and practical in life. And uh, my, uh, Romans says these things were written for our learning. So help us to learn in this area of relationships and I'll thank you for it and I love you. 
And I pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me give you the story in my rendering of it before we read it. David has suspected that something has come up between he and Saul. He says to Jonathan, Saul's son and David's best friend, what have I done that your father is not in the same spirit with me that he was in before? And first Jonathan said, I don't think that's true. David said, I believe it is. And then they, they said, well, well, we'll find out. And what they did, they devised a means by which to find out. And what they did, they said, uh, up in, look at verse 20. Uh, Jonathan said, I will shoot three arrows on this side thereof as though I saw the mark. And behold, I will send a lad saying, go find out the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, behold, the arrows are on this side of thee, take them and come thou. For there is peace to thee and no hurt as the Lord liveth. Now watch this. But I say unto thee, un, uh, unto the but if I say unto the young man, behold, the arrows are beyond thee, go thy way, for the Lord hath sent thee away. What John is saying is, we're going to go through a process, and I'm going to shoot some arrows. If I say the, to the lad there, this side of thee, then that means you can come back. Everything's okay. But if I say the arrows are beyond thee, then it's probably over with. Now look please at verse 35. And it came to pass in the morning of 1 Samuel 20, and it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad with him. And he said unto his lad, run, find out now the arrows which I shoot. And he, the lad ran and he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad was come to the place where the arrow which Jonathan had, Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, is not the arrow beyond thee? And Jonathan cried after the lad, make speed, take haste, stay not. And Jonathan the lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. Uh, look, look at verse uh, 37. Uh, and when he, the lad was come to the place of the arrows which Jonathan shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? What he was saying was this relationship is probably over between Saul and uh, uh, David. Uh, have you been there? You know, uh, life is just one long chain of relationships, isn't it? Some are more valuable than others. I was going to go to the dictionary and find out how many different words in our English language have to do with relationships. Words like father, that mother, that describes relationship. Um, marriage is a relationship. You know, all kinds of wor words. Uh, and so they decided that maybe this relationship was over. Uh, I don't know where you are and you may not need this, but you may need it someday. You may be in the middle of a relationship that's beyond repair. Uh, the, good, the good news is, but I, and I'll get to this, uh, your relationship with God is not. Um, I'll come to that. Let me uh, say this. I, I, I pastored 35 years and been in the gospel ministry full time 62 and I've observed relationships uh, and sometimes they do cease. Here are some things that I've learned about um, relationships that maybe you could uh, learn from. First of all, I learned I'm surprised at those sometimes who do not last. I'm surprised sometimes that relationships that I thought was strong do not last. You know, David and Saul had a strong relationship uh, David was Saul's chief singer. Uh, David uh, fought uh, Saul's battles for him. Uh, David's uh, best friend was Saul's son. David, Saul, in fact, was David's father-in-law. So there's a lot of strength there, you'd think. And I've seen relationships that I thought were strong go bad. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm surprised that uh, the relationship uh, between David and Saul didn't last. I'm surprised the relationship between Barnabas and Saul didn't last, Paul didn't last. And so there are relationships that perhaps 
you know about that you were surprised when you heard they're divorcing. You were surprised. And one day you noticed their seat was empty and they changed churches. So sometimes we're surprised at relationships that don't last. But here are some things I want you to know. Before you decide to write a relationship off, what you should do is go through the ordained process to make sure that it is over with. The process was we're going to go to the field. We're not going to decide that that's that it's over with until we go to the field. And I'm going to shoot an arrow. And I'm going to shoot an arrow. And if I shoot it beyond the boy, uh, the, uh, this side of the boy, then you come back. If I shoot it beyond the boy, you go. That's, that's the process they had to go through before they wrote it off. Do we have a process by which God wants us to go through before we write a person off? I think we do. Would you go to Matthew chapter 18, keep your hand at 1 Samuel 20. Go to Matthew chapter 18 just a moment. And uh, I'm going to show you this. I hope I can help you. In Matthew uh, 18, here's the process he said we ought to go through before we decide that our, our relationship is over with, especially for church churches. Uh, in Matthew 18, I think it's verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. That's process. When you offend me, what should I do? I should go to you alone. You should come to me alone. That's the, pro that's the God-ordained process. And then he goes on and builds on that. But the whole idea is don't write it off until you've done what God said to do about it. Here's what he said to do. He said pray about it. He said to uh, forgive. He said to go. And uh, I think if we do that more often, we'd have less migration in relationships. So the first thing you do, you go through the divine design process. The second thing you do, and keep your hand at Matthew 18. The second thing you do when you're trying to save your relationship is keep those out of it that have no meaningful input in it. Look what he said here in 1 Samuel. Keep your hand at Matthew 18 also. In 1 Samuel, look at verse 39. Verse, 1 Samuel 20, verse 39. But the lad knew not anything. Why well, bring him into it? He can't help solve it. If you go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, the Lord said, go to thee, between thee and him alone. That's a good thing. Why bring people into it that have no real input into the outcome? What are you saying, Brother Keene? Uh, I'm saying that we all have relationships once in a while uh, that uh, need ministered to or they won't survive. But we should want them to survive and therefore uh, we should go with a process to work on getting them to survive. The process is go to your brother alone. Here's the next thing I want you to know David did in this problem with relationships. He was, he was uh, not careful who he took counsel from. Now, I'll show you that. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 24, if you would, just a moment. He was not careful in who he took counsel from. In 1 Samuel 24 and verse 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of the Lord, which uh, saith thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemies into my, thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it seemeth good unto thee. Then David took that, he took that counsel, and then David rose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. Here's David taking counsel from one he should not have taken counsel from. Look what verse 5 says, And it came to pass afterward, that David's heart smote him. You know what that says? That wasn't right. What you told me to do in my situation wasn't the right thing for me to do. You know, I found out in this situation, you can always find somebody to agree with you. Thank you, Brother Keene. Uh, everybody's got a friend. I've done that. I've agreed with people just because I like them. We want to be careful in, in this kind of situation that we do not take counsel from folks who 
perhaps do not have good counsel for us. David learned that, I hope you will. Look at chapter 26 of, of uh, Second Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel and look at verse 8. He got the same counsel again, basically. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. That's the counsel, same counsel. David, we got him cornered, and let's cut him up. You know what David said this time? Look at verse nine. And David said to Abishai, no. That's bad counsel. Do not destroy him. So I'm just suggesting that we ought to be careful about the counsel, who we take counsel from. We ought to be careful and keep people out of the problem that have no input into the problem. We ought to be careful and go through the process before we write the relationship off. Here's the fifth thing I want you to know. I want you to know that in, in, when, you, when you're having a problem with a relationship, when you no longer can respect the person, respect the position he still holds. When you no longer can respect the person, respect the position that he still holds. Look at 1 Samuel 26, just for a moment. Uh, 24, 1 Samuel 24. I hate to keep, keep, keep going back and forth, but I have to do that. Uh, there are folks that, uh, I don't think Saul was worthy of much respect at this point but he was still in the position of king. And so in verse uh, six of chapter 24, it says, and he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed. He said, David's not right, but he's still in the right place. I'm not gonna act this way toward the Lord's anointed. What he was doing, he was respecting David's position when he no longer could respect the person. Look, if you would, at uh, 1 Samuel 26, 9. 26, 9, I know this is 1 Samuel 26, 9. David said uh, to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David's respecting his position. Look at verse 11. He talked about the Lord's anointed. Look at verse 16, the Lord's anointed. Look at verse uh, 23, uh, uh, the Lord's anointed. What are you saying, Brother Keen? I'm saying that there comes a time when maybe you better respect the position when you no longer can respect the person. If I was in my home church where I had a lot of liberty, I'd explain that in detail. That son-in-law that's now broken your daughter's heart is still the father of your grandkids. Respect his position. That wife that broke your son's heart in her infidelity, she's still the mother of your grandkids. That pastor that's done wrong, if God leaves him there, go through the process to remove him, but don't take it in your own hands. Saul was not at this point one that had that deserved great personal respect, but David said, I'm gonna leave him to the Lord. Here's the next thing I want you to do. When a relationship is going bad, don't forget the good that was in it before it went bad. That's good in it. But any relationship you created had some good in it. It did turn off bad. And David had a, a good relationship with, his, uh, 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 with Saul for a, quite a while, but then that relationship turned off bad. And I want you to show, I want to show you something. Go, if you would, to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 18. 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 18. Now they're rehearsing the death of Saul and Jonathan. And in verse 18, uh, David says, also he bade thee to teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasser. What, what David is saying, don't forget while he was king, he taught us how to fight. Don't forget while he was king, he taught us how to be victorious. There was, there was some good in the relationship before it turned off bad. And I wonder what you got out of a relationship before it went south. Look, if you would, down here at verse uh, 24. You daughters of Israel weep over Saul. 
Why? Well, he clothed you in scarlet and other delights who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. All, all, all David is saying was, why don't you remember? There's some good in it. That will keep it from being a waste. It's over with, but there was some good while it lasted. I thought about the good things David got out of being ready to Saul before it went bad. David, because of Saul, David became a national hero. <laughs> David was a national military figure because he fought Saul's battles. That was a good thing. You know, David met his best friend because of Saul, Jonathan. He said that was a good thing. He met the great preacher Samuel while they were in a relationship. That was a good thing. And he got his wife. I don't know about that, but he got his wife while he was in relationship with Saul. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it wasn't a waste. I'm sorry it's over with. You know, uh, I pastor a little church in Milford, Ohio, and the church is, is bigger than the town almost, and uh, I pastored most of them about three times. <laughs> My wife and I learned never to internalize the problem. We see them, we'd wave at them and talk to them, and, wave across the food bar at them when they were on the other side of the deal. Those very folks that maybe broke our heart did a lot of good for us. Taught our kids in Sunday school, help us to send missionaries, help us build buildings debt free. And then we had a hiccup in the relationship and they went one way and we stayed where we were and that's over with, but I don't forget that. I had a man one time in our church, a man, I want a man to Christ in our church, in our church, and he ended up having to sell his, the state bought his house. And he gave it to me. They, they said, we don't want your house, here's the money, and you do what you want to with it. And so he gave the house to me. And we gave it to our school administrator. I thought that was a pretty good thing. The banker said we saved him 18 years of payments. Wasn't very long. I went to school one morning and they just, he'd start a petition on me. Well, I didn't think that's a good thing. He said, if you don't rescind this decision, I'm calling for your resignation. You might as well grab, uh, you think I'm nice and quiet. I used to box. And I found that sometimes forgiveness is easier to get than obedience. <laughs> I didn't even plan to be spiritual. Same man worked for us and he was a good man really. But he got sued for a million dollars over a child endangerment case and our church voted to stand behind him. What's the point, Brother Keene? The point is, didn't turn out right, but he, was a, he helped our school a lot before that happened. So don't forget the good in it. Something you wouldn't have. Something you do have, you wouldn't have if that relationship had not have been. Here's the next thing I want you to know. Don't gloat over your victory. If you win... In a, when a bad relationship goes bad, everybody loses. Everybody loses. Don't, if you think you've won, don't gloat. Can I show you a verse on that? Would you look at verse 20 of chapter 1 of Second Samuel? He said, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Phil uh, Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcision rejoice triumph you know what he's saying don't gloat what good is there in going around and beating your chest because you won the battle you lost a friend I lost a church member I never did honestly before God and my wife and I never did go around defending our position and letting folks know that we won. 
He said, don't gloat. Here's a good point. This is my last one too. Remember, when a, bad, when a good relationship goes bad, there's life after Saul. Your life's not over with. You know, after Saul and David split, he became the sweet singer of Israel. He became the psalmist of Israel. After Saul's and David's relationship was over with, he became king. Don't let the relationship be over because, don't let your life be over because your relationship is. After David and Saul split, he become a prophet. After David and Saul split, the Messiah came through his seed. Can I say to you, I'm sorry it's over with, but there's life left. You know, I pastored in Milford 35 years. I only pastored one church in my lifetime. That's the first Baptist church in Milford. When I got there, they were small and I was greener than grass and dumber than a jar of rocks. But we spent 35 years there. Raised our kids there. Our kids, most of them found their mates there. We married them there. We buried lots of people there. We got old there. My wife embarrassed me this morning like I can't tell you. Dr. Sexton trying to get her to stand up and she's a little hard of hearing. She's back here just sitting looking. <laughs> she used to have better hearing. <laughs> I was thin once. We spent our life in Milford, Ohio. One day God led me to resign. You know what I found out? There's a life after Milford. Since I resigned the church at Milford, I've been in over 300 churches, traveled the world, translated Bibles and met pagans, encouraged missionaries, been allowed to preach in great churches like this one. I'm sorry that it's over, but your life isn't. I've seen men bury their mates and think they can never be happy again and think they'd be wrong that they'd be happy again. Man in our church one time, his wife died and they called me and said, you better go to Jonathan's house. He's, we believe he's losing his mind. And I went in, he was in the closet, his wife's closet and he was stroking her clothes and just wailing. He could not live without her. You in six months he was married. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just, I'm just saying God's always got something more for you if you stay right with him. So what's the point, Brother King? The point is simply this. Work on your relationships. Try to, try to preserve them. All of them won't last, I guess. You might be shocked which ones. And if, if they're not over, stay right so God can still bless you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, there's not a person in this room that didn't identify with something along the way. Because if they're very old in life at all, they've lost a friend, maybe a boyfriend. They've lost a mate, maybe a wife or a husband. Every preacher, I sat beside Dr. Sexton and thought, I wonder who he wonders where they are tonight when they're not here. We all, all of us preachers have lost members. And uh, so it is a, a reality of life, but it doesn't have to conquer us. We can go on and do what you'd have us to do and get glory to you through what's left. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be wise and uh, I'll thank you for it. And I love you. I pray in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you, preacher.